Okay. So today we are going to be talking about, in English, it says old Jaffa, in Hebrew, Yaffa. Um, I prefer to call it Yaffa, but not when that is the same place. And old because it's, well, you'll see <laughs> why old, because it's not really where people live today. They live in the more modern parts. But before we talk about where Yaffa is, what are some of the things that we're going to see there? I want to start by asking you a question. Is your birthday coming up? I don't know when it's coming up and I don't know how old you're turning. Um, I know my Hebrew. So really August is a good month for me. Last week I celebrated four years to Aliyah for my Hebrew date. This week is my Hebrew birthday. Next week is my English Aliyah date and the week after is my English birthday. So <laughs> I have a lot to celebrate. Um, I want to ask you, let's say your family came to you and said, you have a birthday coming up and we want to do something to commemorate it. We want to honor you in some way. What would you tell them? Now, you could say nothing, um, or you could think of something. How would you want people to honor you? What would you want done? So I want you to, to keep that question in mind. And I want to show you the, the first step, and then I'm, I'm going to give a big introduction, but this is just uh, to give you a little bit of a taste. If you go to Yafa today, you will see this tall clock tower. Now, there are six of them in Israel, not all standing. There used to be one actually in Jerusalem, right by the, the Jaffa Gate, um, right, right by Sha'ad Yafa, and then the British took it down. Now, what is this clock tower doing here? So it was built to honor somebody, not their birthday, but their rule. There was the last Turkish Sultan, there was a period in time, a long period in time, where the Turks ruled Israel, and the last Sultan, Abdul Hamid, the, well, I was about to say Ashani, um, used to like speaking his name in Hebrew, um, in order to honor 25 years to his rule, the people, Jews and non-Jews alike, they built this clock tower to honor him. Now, I don't know if I ask you the question, anyone thought, hey, I would love a big clock tower so everyone can know what time it is and, and see something really cool, but this is what he did. Now, we, to, where are we on the map? So I always love starting with, with Jerusalem to get to Yaffa. Um, when I Google mapped it, I did it during a traffic -y hour because you see that it's in red and it's an hour and 11 minutes or an hour and 14 minutes. Normally it's um, shorter, about like 45 minutes, 50 minutes. So that, that's the drive. Um, but I'd say people are more familiar with Tel Aviv Yafa, not so much in terms of how far it is away from Jerusalem, but because the airport, when you land in Ben Gurion Airport, God willing, soon, 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 it says TLV Tel Aviv. And any map, almost every map, I can't say for any map, but you look at, you can see over here, it's Tel Aviv dash Yaffa, because you can see Yaffa from Tel Aviv, you can see Tel Aviv from Yaffa, it's considered almost the same city, but there are differences, especially on the older part, which is what we are going to focus on. So today, we are going to visit sites in old Yaffa, the Mediterranean Sea, because who wouldn't want to visit the Mediterranean Sea? And the most fun shuk, most people are familiar with is Shuk Machana Yehuda, because when we when we come to Israel and trips, of course, we're going to go to Yerushalayim. If you've never been to Shuk HaPish Beshim in Yafo, it is such a fun shuk. I remember the first time I went, I was 18, and I've gone many times after that. I'll tell you about that later, but very, very fun. So we're going to look at all these sites. And the bigger question we are going to keep in mind is, what do you want your legacy to be? And all the sites that we're going to focus on today are going to have to do with that, with that question of legacy. Okay. First, so we already saw the clock tower, but I want to continue the story, only for you part of it. So according to uh, tradition that has been passed down, uh, who were the major funders of building this tower? So right in the square, there was a store. And in the store, there was a man named Joseph Moyal. Now, Joseph Moyal was, according to the story, the only one that had a watch. And it was right around the time where the train line from Yaffa to Yerushalayim was built. And people always need to know what time it is because they need to know when the train is coming. So what would they do? They go into his shop. What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? What time is it? And Dali couldn't take it anymore. And he said, that's it. I'm helping fund the building of the clock. Now, something really uh, unique about this that it's interesting thought, they actually, they would have bells that would go off um, every hour. Now, when we think of of bells, we think of a church because you can tell the time based on when the bells ring on a church. And the fact that it was on this clock tower, which is not connected to a church, all of a sudden it's taking away power from churches and it's putting it in the hands of the average citizen because now you don't need the churches to know what time it is. Every average guy could know. And I, I, I never really think about that, that 
the fact that we have latches, we are in control of our own time as opposed to other people telling us what time it is. So it's just a nice thing to keep in mind. So this was how they wanted to honor Abdul Hamid II. This over here, another stop in Yafa. And at the end, I'm going to show you how close everything is. All this could be done walking. Should be done walking. If you do it in a car, it'll take you a very long time. So this is known as the Sibyl of Abu Nabut. What does Sibyl mean? So the word Sibyl, it's similar to the Hebrew word Shvil, which means path. Or in Turkish, it means fountain. If you immediately upon looking at it, you guys see that there's these three faucets over here. You also notice that the stones are in different color because they come from different parts of Israel. And why was it built? What's the story behind it? So another Turkish ruler, I love this story. His name was Abu Nabut. Abu meaning Abba, father. Nabut uh, means club. So if his name is father of the club, he was a tough ruler. And they say about him, anyone he didn't like, he would just uh, go off with their heads. Now, one day he decided to leave the city gates and go take a stroll uh, down the nice orange orchards. And he saw this beautiful leafy tree and he sat under a tree and he took a nice nap. And when he woke up, the sun was already setting. So he quickly, quickly, quickly hurried back to his palace gates. And he already missed it. He had this, uh, they were shut. So he told the gates, open the, open. He told the guards, open the gate for me. They said, no, sundown. Abu Nabut has a rule. When the sun sets, no one gets in. Okay, but I'm Abu Nabut. <laughs> yeah, sure. He's in his palace sleeping. What, you, you think that's going to work on us? I'm telling you, don't you recognize my voice? No, we're not going to believe you. What, you're just trying to get in. You now go sleep outside with all the rest of the guys. No matter what, no matter what he tried, they would not let him in. So he slept outside. The next morning, the gates open and he goes in. First thing he does is he gives a very big medal to his guards because he said, you know, you guys really, really, I see, you go by what I say. But after he gave them the medal, he killed them because how dare you not open the gates for me? So um, then he realized when I spent the night outside the city gates, it was a very long night and I was very thirsty. So I wonder if there are other people that maybe get locked out and don't make it in time. And they're also thirsty. So let me build this fountain for them to drink. And we have on one hand this cruelty. And on the other hand, we have this beautiful thing that he left behind. And they said about, uh, what was said about rulers that left water for the people to drink, that it was a very kind deed and something that will stand with them for a very long time. So um, we see that this is one of the things he left behind, water. Okay. I want to um, discuss a minute the name of Yafo. So it's very similar to one of the sons of Noach. If we open up Parashat Noach, Vayolid Noach Shilosha Banim, Et Shem Et Cham, Ve'et Yafet. So really, I, I'm embarrassed to say that most of my life, I, I don't even know how old I was when I discovered that the third name of Noach's child was not Yafet, it was Yafet. It's Yafet because of the Sof Asuk. Um, so it changes to a kamatz, but I was like, why didn't they tell me that in school? Because you always say Shem Cham and Yafet, but it's Yafet. So the third son of Noah, his name is Yafet. And according to legend, after the Mabul, after the flood, Noah's son Yafet built Yafo. So it's named Yafo after him. And you guys can see from the street sign over here, Echov Yafet. One of the main streets is called Yafet Road after um, Yafet. So it's a nice connection. Now, where is Yafo mentioned in the Tanakh? Yafo is one of the oldest courts. And we see if we open up the book of Yonah, which we read as the Haftarah in Yom Kippur, So Yonah is running away from God because he doesn't want to go to Ashur, as God commanded him. And when he takes the boat and sails off, what port is he using? The port of Yafo. So it's really amazing that the Yafo we're looking at today, it's the same Yafo at which he sailed. The Yafo is a natural port, which is why it was used. Where else do we see Yafo in the Tanakh? When Shalomo HaMelech was building the Beit HaMikdash, so he would use cedars from Lebanon. And how is he getting them? Um, how, uh, how are they coming into the country? So if we read the Pasuk, we see, V'anachnu nechrot et simin ha-Lebanon kechol kecha unvi'im so they said they're going to take the trees and they're going to bring them through the gates of Yafo. So when visiting Yafo, oops, wait, hold on. Ah, I want to go back. Okay. When visiting Yafo, we are also at the place where the trees to build the Beit HaMikdash were. So how cool is that? Yonah Hanavi, and now the trees to build the Beit HaMikdash. And in the bottom, you see a picture of that. 
Not only when the trees from the Beit HaMikdash were coming into Israel, was Yafo used as a port, and not only from Yonah selling off, it was also used when Jews made Aliyah. Nowadays, um, when you make Aliyah, you have the good fortune of coming on an airplane, and if you're even luckier, on a Nefesh Benefesh flight, where everyone is greeting you when you come. So for a very long time in history, people did not have that, and from 1882 to 1948, the steps you see here were the steps that the Jews would come up when they made Aliyah. They would come on ships and they came up the steps. Now, uh, a Jewish person that is waiting so long to come to Eretz Yisrael and finally, 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 they came. What is one of the first things they wanted to do? So I love this imprint right next to the steps on the dock. You see, it, it, in the beginning, it, like the first time I, the, not like, <laughs> the first time I saw this, I said, what is this? What am I looking at? So I want you guys to notice, you see hands. You see feet, and these are knees, and this is the person's head. This is an imprint of someone kissing the ground, because when the people came to Eretz Yisrael, they were so excited to be here that the first thing they did is they kissed the ground, so they have imprinted the position of someone kissing the ground, um, which I think is really cool, and connecting back to the same set of legacy, any person moving to Eretz Yisrael, he's not only moving for himself because he wants a different life, or maybe a better life, he's moving for the future of his children, and one of the things that fascinates me, anytime I meet someone in Israel, I always ask them who in their family made Aliyah. Obviously, because I made Aliyah myself, I'm fascinated by the topic of Aliyah and why'd you make Aliyah and how old were you and who'd you come with? But almost everyone in Israel, unless they could trace the family back generations, almost everyone you meet, at least on one side, my grandma made Aliyah, my parents made Aliyah, my great grandma made, made Aliyah. And it's really nice that it's really country of Olim. And that person made Aliyah, and then the kids, they're here for one generation, and they're so Israeli, and it's like they were, they were here their whole life. So it, it's really a special thing. And in making Aliyah, a person is definitely thinking of the future of their family and where they want their kids to be with. So when you come to Yafo, you can see the steps, and you can see this imprint. Now, Eretz Yisrael is something that is part of our heritage. It's part of our faith. HaKadosh Baruch Hu promised Abraham, Yitzchak, and Yaakov that he would give them Eretz Yisrael and to their children. Now, taking the topic of faith, if you have to pick three events to represent Israel's faith throughout the years, what would you pick? About a month ago, I gave a Zoom on the Menorah, and I spoke about, um, in front of the Knesset, there's the Menorah that was given to Israel as a gift. Uh, if you missed that, so many interested, you could find it on YouTube. One of the things that I said is that Menorah has 30 events that, that, uh, of Jewish history. Now, and you need to pick three. I don't know where I would start, maybe Har Sinai. It's a very hard thing. Um, but someone was up to the test, and I want to show you a statue, that, a very unique statue that was made in Yafa that you could see when you come and visit to represent um, the faith throughout the years. So this statue is called Sha'ad Ha'emuna, or the Gate of Faith. Now, no matter how many times I look at it, always when I look at it, I get so confused. I'm like, what am I looking at? And then even after I know what it is, it's still hard for me to understand, but I'm, try I'm gonna try to break it down by different pieces so you can understand. Um, first, we'll talk about what we're looking at, and then we'll comment on the significance of the gate. And what you, what you don't see in the picture, but is on the other side, is the gorgeous Mediterranean Sea. And this um, gate, Statue is also located in this gorgeous garden. So it's just breathtaking to go and see it. So I want to talk a little bit about what you're looking at because it's hard to make it out. So this over here is a head. This is the hair and the person's head is like, like that, like tilted up. And this is a nose, an eye. Um, this person is on their knees, their knees, knees, knees. Person's hand, he's holding something up. We're going like that. And over here is a ram. Now, if you have someone and his ram, now who's he holding up? He's holding up another person. So this, these might be enough clues for you to guess that this is none other than Akedat Yitzchak, which is depicted over here. So the artist, Don Kafri, in 1974, said this is one of the pillars of faith because HaKadosh Baruch Hu promised Abraham uh, that he would have a lot of children and his children would go into Eretz Yisrael. He didn't specifically give him that promise of Eretz Yisrael and Yitzchak, but it's still very symbolic. And so we have Abraham here and Yitzchak over there. So that's pillar one. What's the other side of the gate? So also hard to make out. Um, and this here is Yitzchak's hair. You have to be very creative. Um, but you can, you can see it. And in, in person, it's when you stand back, maybe it's even easier. This over here, this is super creative. These are wings. Wings of hope. 
So this is an angel. You have one angel that's facing down, one angel that's facing up. These are the bodies of the angels. And over here on the bottom, you have somebody that's sleeping and he's dreaming about angels. Who slept and dreamt about angels? And the way the wings of the angels are designed is to remind us of the ladder. So this is none other than the dream of Yaakov with the ladder. And the artist thought that this was another huge pillar because we have Yaakov Avinu and he has a dream and God tells him he's going to take care of him and eventually promises him Eretz Yisrael as well. So we have the promise to the Avot of you're going to get Eretz Yisrael finally, which culminates on the top. This is easier to say. So we already got used to the idea that this is hair. So these are people with beards. They're Kohanim. And they're all carrying in their hands Shofarot. Why are they carrying in their hands Shofarot? Because this might remind you of a war. The first war that B'nai Yisrael fought when they came into Eretz Yisrael was to conquer Yericho, or Jericho. And they had to circle the city six times, and on the seventh day, seven times, and they carried Shofarot in their hands. So the artist feels that this culminates here. We have the promise to get into Eretz Yisrael, and finally we get Eretz Yisrael. And he calls the Shara Muna, the, the gate of faith, because he feels that the, the faith of the Jewish people throughout the years that God would give them Eretz Yisrael came true, and then he eventually gave them. Now, uh, I got a few birthrights. I have gotten birthright, and we go to Yafo every year. And one of the things I do with them is I said, I want everyone to, to think about these ideas, and I want you to walk through the gate. And it's really powerful when you're walking through the gate, thinking of what all these things, these things represent, and you walk through and you see the Mediterranean Sea. And then, well, you can't see from this point the imprint of the people on the steps, but that's another um, stop on the tour. So it really gets you thinking of what is your faith? What builds your identity? What do you want to leave to, to other people? What do you want your legacy to be? So really, I think these issues are very, very strong in Yafa. I want to point out another thing that's really cool. So one, you notice the guy in the background. <laughs> but behind the guy, you guys see buildings. And this is not other than the city of Tel Aviv. Now, Tel Aviv, we see this tall skyscraper is how big it is. When people think of Tel Aviv today, um, they maybe they think of parties, going out. It's a very, very busy city. Millions of people passing through every day. Second biggest city in Israel, Yerushalayim is the first. And what did Tel Aviv look like to start? So we are by the Mediterranean Sea. This is what Tel Aviv looked like. And it's really, really incredible. You have people on a beach. And the way Tel Aviv was started was originally everyone was living in Yafa and there was just no more room. So we said, okay, we need people to move out. And they did it by a lottery. They took these pieces of shells because they're by the beach and they wrote numbers on it. And whoever picked a, a number or a lot, this is where you would move. And this is Tel Aviv. Tel Aviv was started in 1909, known as the first Hebrew city. And it's amazing to see this. <laughs> I love seeing the picture every time. And then to see the buildings that you see through here. Another uh, stop that you will see along the way is something called Pesel Hatapuz Hataloi, the floating orange tree. It, it's a really interesting thing to look at because you look at it and you don't really get it. What I want to, uh, one, ask yourself, what's the first thing that's coming to mind when you see this? What feeling does it bring to you? I'm going to add some descriptions in which help emphasize it. We have an orange tree that's in this a concrete bowl held by iron chains in a stone alleyway. So the things I described, they're not, they're all man-made and then, well, stones could be natural, but the paved is it. And what the, this um, was designed in 1993 by an artist named Dan Mohin. And what he wants to convey is the fight of nature you only you look at this and you want the tree to break through you wonder how long could the tree be in this without breaking through and that i think is a question that we're constantly asking ourselves today as individuals as a society what's my relationship to nature am i connected to the natural world am i not um am i breaking free am i not so i think by looking at this orange tree all those ideas could get conveyed and the way we relate to nature is especially important as to how the world is going to look to uh, to our children. So that's another thing to keep in mind. I love, love, love looking at this um, statue. Okay. Speaking of oranges, a lot of people are familiar with Yafo because they've heard of the Jaffa orange. And here's an advertisement by Jaffa oranges, finest for flavor. A, a, a fun fact you might not have known fascinated me the first time I liked it. That, oh wait, okay, before I tell you the fun fact, I just want to talk a little bit about the oranges. 
So um, Yafo oranges, they actually never really grew in Yafo itself. The farmers lived in Yafo and the orchards were more on the side. And they're not indigenous to Israel oranges. In the seventh century from the far east, oranges were brought. Originally, they were these small sour things and then eventually they developed it. And then in about the 1700s, the Arabs were able to get this strain of orange that was really, really sweet and it got so, so popular. And during the British, when the mandate, when the British ruled, oranges were constantly being exported and they were really, really famous for being so juicy and sweet. And they were so famous that the fame still continued. This over here, if you see this picture, it's a little bit blurry, but you have stickers that say Jaff on it. And if you look on the bottom, it says Rabbinical Council of California. These oranges are not sold in Israel. They are sold in California. Now you could say, okay, but they came from Yafa. So not necessarily. Now actually, um, I found this by Google image and then I clicked on the article. I, I, I want to tell you what the article said because I, I, want, I mean, I'm sure they researched it, but what it said uh, on this Rabbinical Council of California, it has come to our attention that there are oranges sold from Israel in the market and it's the year of Shemitah, so you need to be very, very careful. Now, it could be that they really did come from Israel, but it also could be that they didn't and they just have the name Yafa. And in that case, you don't have to do any Shemitahs or anything if the oranges didn't grow in Israel. And the reason why I'm saying that is because today, the tag Jaffa orange became a tag. And uh, the companies that use it, they actually pay rights to Israel to use the name and there's really no connection. They don't, as far as I know, they don't even grow oranges in Yaffa anymore. Um, this, this is a really cool thing. So the company is Tesco that they have rights to use the name Jaffa. And if you look on top, Spanish, Clement, Spanish Clementines. And I read the article and the article said that this is from Spain. These oranges grew in Spain, but it says Yaffa, Spain Yaffa. But we said that it's just the name Jaffa oranges. So know that if you go to the supermarket, you see Jaffa oranges, they most probably did not come from Yaffa. Maybe they did, maybe they didn't. But it's just, it was so popular, the name Jaffa orange that people associated together. So it's just a cool fun fact to know. Okay. Now we are going to uh, discuss a little bit the Mediterranean Sea. Just looking at the picture, I want to jump in. I mentioned that I went in a different zoom, that I went to the Mediterranean Sea a few weeks ago on a Friday. I don't know if you've ever swam in it. Um, I know a lot of people come to Israel in the winter where it's cold to swim, but it is really, really worth it to come when it's hot out just to swim in the Mediterranean Sea. What is so amazing about it? Now, the ocean that I'm most familiar with is the, Atlant is the Atlantic Ocean. Um, and deal, you go to the beach, you go in the ocean. Now, I can't remember the last time I went into the Atlantic Ocean because it's always freezing and it's brown and the water is dirty. It's just not, you don't really, really want to go in. The Mediterranean Sea, anytime I've gone in, which is when it's warm out, it's always so warm and you go in and it's clear. You could look at your hand and you could see a manicure. I'm like, wow, I feel like I'm on an exotic island. I am, it's Israel. So it's really a very pleasant sea to swim in. So I highly encourage you to come to swim in the Mediterranean Sea. And when you come to Yafo's Mediterranean Sea, what you will notice is that there's a bunch of rocks and there's an Israeli flag on the rock. Now, what is, what are, what's the story behind this? So I'm gonna show you at the end of the Zoom, if you Google map Yafo and like you zoom in, what you're gonna see is, um, so the name, this name could be pronounced Andromeda, Andromeda, I, I say Andromeda, uh, rocks, that's what it says on the list, on the map. What's the story behind this? So, it, we're going back now thousands and thousands of years to, to Greek mythology. There was this kingdom. Um, there was a king and his wife's name was Cassiopeia. And she had a daughter named Andromeda. And Andromeda was gorgeous. So Cassiopeia would always brag, I have the prettiest daughter in all the land. She's so gorgeous. She's so gorgeous. And then what happened is the mermaids got jealous that she was always bragging about how pretty her daughter is. So the mermaids went to Poseidon, the king of the sea, and said, and Dramita is always bragging about her daughter. So he said, okay, she deserves to be punished. And he calls the sea monster and the sea is ravaging and it's going to destroy the kingdom. So they find out that the only way to save the kingdom from being ravaged by the storm is to tie her naked to a rock. So they take Andromeda and they tie her to a rock naked. And luckily for her, Zeus's son, Perseus, is just coming back from slaying Medusa. And he sees this gorgeous woman tied to the rocks and he falls in love and he saves her and he marries her. Now, um, people have the 
custom to tell this story over here and give the name um, Andromeda and Andromeda to these racks. One of the things you'll notice when you walk through the streets of Yafo, of the old city, one is how pretty it is. And a lot of the names are named after astrology. They have like this whole astrology thing, mythology. So it's really, really very fun that you come to Yafo and you have so many things you, uh, that you could, you have Tanakh and then you have mythology and you have modern day Aliyah and then you talk about oranges. There's a lot going on and it's just a beautiful place and you have the Mediterranean Sea following you along the whole way. So that, that's also a really nice thing to go and see. The port, if you walk, so here you see in the background Tel Aviv and you see the contrast. This is Tel Aviv and this is the old city. Walking along the port is really, really nice. They also have a very good fish restaurant. I don't know what it's called, but I remember eating there once and the fish was great. Also very, very cute, not kosher, but they have this restaurant called The Old Man in the Sea. It was like, oh, how cute, Ernest Hemingway. They took his book, The Old Man in the Sea, and they made it the name of a restaurant. And there's boats, and it's just really, really a fun place to be. You see people fishing, and there's also access down, um, a little bit further down over here. There's access to the beach, so it's really, really a very beautiful experience. Here we have a picture from 1930 of loading ships with oranges. As I said before, that it was a major export. And also this picture we saw already, but this is along the dock. So when you're looking, walking along the dock, enjoying the beauty of the Mediterranean Sea, you'll also get, get a chance to look at this. Now, what would a trip to Yafo be if you would stop at their flea market? So I want to show you some of the things that they have there. In Hebrew, it's called Shuka Pishpeshim. So here's a, a bonus. You will learn a Hebrew word today unless you already know it. Pishpeshim is how you say flea. It's translation. It's flea market. And they have everything. You could see just from this one picture. I can't believe they sell so much in one store. You have clothing over here, jewelry, this, I don't even know what it is, all kinds of things. Um, the market was started in the 1800s and it has a lot of land with secondhand goods. You could furnish your entire home from things you find there. Uh, you definitely bargain with them. And it's a fun place for kids or adults just to walk around, see what they have. I feel like my grandma would be very good at this place. Like there's certain people that know how to find like the nice things among all the junk. So just to look at some other pictures. Here um, they have, well, some of it is closed, just like in the Shukin Yushalayim. You have all well, the clothing, scarves, jackets, jewelry. I, it's like over, it's overwhelming to look at. I don't know how you would find something. I mentioned earlier that I come with birth, right? And I have this thing sometimes where I like buying presents for myself. I said, I you're working hard. You deserve a present. Buy yourself a $5 bracelet or something. And I always spend so much time looking. But I'm like, I don't like this. I don't like that. And it's just, it's like, it's so much to look at. And then you have all the store owners. They see them in the tour guide because I'm wearing the tour guide tag. Oh, come tell all your birth artists to come here. We'll give them a discount. And I don't re I don't, I mean, if they want to come to the store, let them come to the store, but I'm not going to bring that. Like if they want to go and let them go in, I'm not going to encourage certain stores. Um, but it's, it's definitely such a fun place. I've yet to buy myself jewelry from there, but on birthright, we go to so many shooks that if I don't go to this one, I'll go from something else. Here we see things that you could put in your house tray. I'm sure you could buy this chandelier over here. Just all odds and ends. Jewelry, more organized store. Khamsa, it's in all different colors. And now I would like to summarize and then answer the question we asked in the beginning. So we started out and we saw the clock tower. I asked you if someone was going to honor you for your birthday, what would you want? And we said this clock tower was built in order to honor the Sultan ruler. Then we saw the Sabil of Abu Nabuth. We told the story about how he was really, really thirsty. And then he, when he got locked out and we saw how beautiful it was with all the different colors and the different stones of Israel. Then we spoke about the origin of Yafo's name, mentioned Yafet Nawach San. We mentioned that where Yafo is found in the Tanakh with Yonah Hanavi sailing out from Yafo. Now on Yom Kippur, when you read about Yonah Hanavi sailing out from Yafo, you could kind of picture it. And Be'ashalim uh, HaMelech bringing the trees. We discussed the steps of the Olim, how excited they were when they take the first steps into Eretz Yisrael and the imprint as they kiss the ground, all coming through the same port, coming through the same place. We saw Sha'ar Hamuna, the gate of faith. And he, it's specifically in Yafo because Yafo is being the gate into Eretz Yisrael, where, where, what is, where is a more proper place to put the gate of faith according to the artist. And we saw on one side, Akadat Yitzchak, Yaakov in his dream, and on top we saw the Kohanim carrying the Shofarot connected to Kibush Yericha, conquering Yericha. Then we saw the hanging orange tree and, and discussed the desire of the artist to show 
us wanting to break out of the <laughs> what's holding you back and connect to nature. We looked at the beautiful Mediterranean Sea, discussed how awesome it is to swim in there. We uh, told the story of and Andromeda's rocks, and we ended with Shukha Pish Bashim and said it's really, really fun to spend time there. I didn't talk about food, but of course there is, there's food uh, in Yaffa, really not so much kosher. I always get stuck because I only could take my groups to eat hummus. But they, hopefully they're, they're building on that more, or you could eat in Tel Aviv and then come to Yaffa, you could figure it out. And I made Shukha Pish Bashim in color because it's a very colorful place. Now we want to go to our question we asked, what we want our legacy to be. What do we want to leave behind? How does a trip in Yafo bring all that out of us? I'm going to just go back a minute to just comment on that point. We said that in building the clock tower, uh, well, one that's honoring him, and we said that the Sibyl, he's leaving water to his descendants. And the steps of the Olim, the Olim are thinking about what do I want my children's future to be? And how is now for the gate of faith how is my faith built from what came before me? What faith do I want to leave to my children? How connected do I want to be to the natural world? And Adet Yafo, like, uh, like anything, and last week I spoke about Kesaria, Caesarea, and I, I said, you know, a day at the beach could be just a day at the beach or it could be so much more. I think Yafo as well. You could walk around Yafo and it can be a pretty place, which really is even more than enough because it's gorgeous being there. And I mentioned last week that the, after my third year of Aliyah, when I listed all the reasons why I love living in Israel. I surprised myself and reason number one was because it's beautiful. It's just a beautiful place and there's so much beauty to see, especially by the sea the whole time. But once you have knowledge of history, it just makes it so much more powerful. And I really, really encourage you to always continue learning about who, you, who we are, us, myself, I'm telling this to myself too. We should learn about who we are as Am Israel. And what our history is and about the land of Israel, which is huge, a huge part of who we are, that especially in Sefer Devarim, the Torah is always talking about it because the more you know about Israel, the more you could be connected to what came before you and what's going to come after you and you can, what you could leave to your kids and what you could teach your kids. And then oh, a day in Yafa, you, know, you didn't just have, oh, a nice day, cute, we went to the market. You thought about all of these things and walking on the dock, you see the, the imprint from the Olim and there's so many real deep messages and, and topics you could think about uh, a, a trip to Israel or really a trip anywhere. You can do this anywhere in the world, but of course you could do it even more in Israel because it is our heritage, our identity. So that is what I want you to think about, what you want to leave your children. I'm going to think about that too for my future children. Oh, oh, forgot about this. So this is a map where all the, all the places that we spoke about are in red. You see how close it is. The clock tower, the uh, everything is on the list. I'm forgetting already to go through it. And then here is the port in the thread. I told you, right? The rock is actually on Google Maps. And the shuk over here, this line, it leads to shuk So everything is really, really close. Beautiful, beautiful day to spend with your family. You can spend half a day, a full day. And there is so much more, but I couldn't include everything because I need to leave you for things to stay. Thank you so much for joining. This is very enjoyable for me. I think I want to go take a trip to Yafo now, and I wish you a wonderful rest of the day.